Good morning. I just want to let you guys know that Bacon Sunday is a religious holiday here at Capital City. <laughs> just two, real quick. If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims. There we go. Uh, one more. One more. Um, I used to think the refrigerator, I mean the uh, dryer, the dryer was shrinking my clothes. Then I realized it was the refrigerator. All right, that's all. <clears throat> since January, <laughs> you dork. Um, since January, we've been searching for a younger man to come alongside me to learn Capital City and to transition into the lead in about three years. I want to stress again that even after that time, I'll still be here doing preaching and teaching. But we're looking for a younger man with more energy, passion, and fresh vision as our lead. We've been in conversations with Ben Webb for quite a few weeks now. John and I and the elders and the staff and quite a few groups from this church. And we have extended an offer to Ben, and he has accepted that offer. And that's cool. That's a good response because he's a good young man, really, really a good young man. He's only 38, so he doesn't have the mature sense of humor that I have. But he's, uh, but he's a good young man. He's going to be starting as our associate minister here on the 1st of August. I'll be giving you some bio on Ben in the next week or two. So let's, let's pray here real quick. Father, we're so grateful. You're so good to us, to this church family. And we do pray for Ben and this church family during this time of transition. Because we believe, Lord, that the best days of Capital City are in front of us, not behind us. And we want you to use us to make a difference in this community and in this world. We love you dearly. And now we pray that the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts will please you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, a couple of weeks ago I told you the story of two young medics who used a 900-year-old church as a hospital on D-Day, World War II. And they didn't care what uniforms the wounded wore. They treated Americans, Germans, French. Outside the church it was about killing. Inside the church it was about healing. And they just laid the wounded out on the pews, made quite a mess. Well, those who went to that church did not replace the pews. They didn't clean them, cover them up. They just left them there, all blood-stained, because they think that that's kind of what the church is about, a hospital for the wounded, and it doesn't matter what uniform you wear out there. I think it's a cool image. If you guys were here at Capital City 25 years ago, and there are a few of you who were, you might remember Scott and Jen Melton. Scott was our youth minister for a time. Jen worked in the office. Great people. I got an email from Scott last week. He said this. He said, Coach, that's what they called me when I was a coach. Coach, listen to your sermon last week. I happened to be in France and thought you might enjoy these pictures. He's there, Angleville all plain, checking out the church with bloodstained pews. Pictures you've been looking at were taken by Scott and Jen. Isn't that cool? We decided to call this sermon series Bloodstained Pews because we want this place to be a place where the wounded find healing irrespective of what uniforms they might wear outside these walls. But if it's going to be a place where they can find healing, it had better be a place where we find healing here. So we're talking about some of the roadblocks, some of the roadblocks that get in the way, some of the junk that gets in the way of our own healing by God. Last week we talked about pride. This week's about guilt and shame. Pride probably prevents more healing than any other sin that we struggle with. Guilt and shame, probably the next biggest roadblock. So I'm going to start off this morning by giving you the ending. There's a lot here. I'm going to give you nine big ideas. We're going to pull up the light just a little bit for this part. Find this piece of paper that's pretty close to you, okay? And kind of read along with, with me, if you don't mind. I'm not going to unpack them yet. I'm just going to go through them. These are nine big ideas about guilt and shame. And guys, if you will, if you'll master these, it'll change your life. It'll heal you. Number one, the only self I need to measure up to is the self that God means me to be. Number two, I am accepted by the grace of God without regard to my deserving. You buy that? Three, I am accepted by God along with my shadows and the mix of good and bad that I breed in those shadows. 
Number four, this is huge. Grace has set me free to accept myself totally without conditions, even though I don't approve of everything that I accept. You buy that? Number five, nothing I deserve to be ashamed of will ever make me unacceptable to God. Number six, I can forgive anyone who has ever infected me with shame that I don't deserve. Number seven, I can forgive myself for anything that I've ever done to shame myself or anybody else. Number eight, the grace of God heals the shame I don't deserve and the grace of God heals the shame that I do deserve. And grace is the very best thing in the world. Take this with you. Look it over. Some of you may be skeptical. And you might be looking at some of these things and saying, I wish, but I'm going to try to convince you this morning. And if you buy it, it will change your life. Ready? So let's start here. Think about the most shameful, reprehensible, hurtful thing that you've ever done. If you've got a long list of those things like Vern does, just pick one of them. <laughs> now, lean over to the person next to you and tell them what you did. That's humor, by the way. Don't do that. We're not going to do it that way. We're going to use an open mic. Just come up front and tell us all. Just kidding. Remember, Ben doesn't have my sense of humor. Isn't that cool? Whatever your worst moment was, what have you done with it? Did you get caught? Did you get shamed, humiliated, disgraced? Did you tell anyone? Is there some person or some small cluster of people who know your deepest, darkest secrets and who have some kind of power over you now? Does the memory of what you did ever haunt you? Do you ever wish you could go back and have a do-over? Well, imagine getting caught in the act. In the act, the very worst thing you've ever done. Adultery, cheating, stealing, lying, porn, betrayal, blasphemy. Maybe you tore the tag off a pillow. <laughs> imagine getting caught in the act. And the lights come on, cameras come out, Everybody sees, everybody knows, makes the news maybe, goes viral on the social media, maybe cops. Maybe you're dragged right up front here. And we all see your sin displayed on those screens. Well, you're going to look at a story this morning where exactly something like that happened. And it could be my story, and it could be yours. Now, before we get to the story, I want to to define a couple of terms. Now, some people define these terms differently, but for this sermon, right here, right now, I want to define what I mean by guilt and shame. Ready? Start with guilt. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, guilt is the fact of having done something wrong or having committed a crime. You did a bad thing, right? You've crossed a line. You did something wrong. You broke the rules. You broke the law. You're guilty. That's guilt. Shame? Shame is that set of painful feelings, humiliation, disgrace, disappointment, maybe disgust with yourself that come when you do cross a line, when you do something wrong, when you break the rules, break the law. If you cross a line, you're guilty. Shame is that awful emotion that comes, I hope, when you are guilty. Here's where it gets muddy. Who gets to draw the line? Who ought, to, who ought to feel shame? Who gets to make the rules? Who gets to decide what's right and wrong for you, for me? And a lot of us are kind of like, well, who made you the boss of me? Just because it's wrong for you doesn't mean it's wrong for me and it feels so good. How could it be wrong? Bottom line, a lot of people, maybe some of you guys, think it's your right to draw the line, Right? And some people set the bar really, really low. Do pretty much whatever you want. No rules, just right. And if you set the bar really, really low, there's not a lot of guilt and there's not a lot of shame. Other people set the bar really, really high. In fact, some of you guys make more rules than God. And if you set the bar really, really high, there's just a boatload of guilt and there's a boatload of shame, you think. But what if? What if there really is a God? 
And what if God really does get to decide what's right and wrong for you and for me, for all of us? What if God actually likes to be God? Well, if there really is a God, and there is, and if God really does get to decide what's right and wrong for all of us, and He does, then there is appropriate guilt and appropriate shame, right? Appropriate guilt when you break God's laws. You violate the will of God, and you don't acknowledge that you are guilty. You have a problem. You're messed up. And if you violate the will of God, guys, and you don't feel any shame, then you have a problem, right? If sinning doesn't shame you, you have a serious problem. So there is good guilt and shame, healthy guilt and shame, appropriate guilt and shame, but there's also bad, unhealthy, inappropriate guilt and shame. Sometimes people try to shame you when you've done nothing wrong in the eyes of God. They try to mess with your feelings when you've done nothing wrong. That's not good shame. Sometimes people try to shame you instead of trying to pat you up. They just try to rub your face in your sin. That's not right. Sometimes we refuse to accept God's forgiveness. We refuse to accept God's grace. We refuse to let go of the guilt and shame when God is trying to take it away. And that's not right either. Bottom line, guys, inappropriate guilt and shame either destroy or emasculate more Jesus followers than about anything else with the exception, perhaps, of pride, which we talked about last week. Those are the two biggest roadblocks to our healing two biggest roadblocks to their healing, pride and inappropriate guilt and shame. Now, I know, guys, some people just blow God off. They don't accept His rules. And if there really is a God, they're going to have an issue. They need some healing. Others of us, we do accept God's rules. We acknowledge our guilt and our shame, but we never really accept His forgiveness. We never really accept God's grace. We've got a problem too. We need some healing. And some of us, we just put on masks. We know we're guilty. We feel the shame. We put on masks and we pretend like we're doing just fine, right? We want others to look at us as if we have everything together. But inside, we feel like fakes. You know why? Because we don't trust the grace of God right? And so we go through life with wounds that never heal. Guys, God has given us some rules. You know why? Because He loves us. There are things that that are right because they're going to make life better, even when you don't understand it yet. There are things that are wrong because they're going to make life worse, whether we understand it or not. And shame is a gift from God when you cross His line. It's a gift from God that's intended to straighten you out if you use it right. And this forgiveness, this grace that heals us, that's what God wants us to offer people out there who are wounded. God's grace will heal you and it'll heal them. Do you buy that? And that's what this story is all about. So here goes. Now, guys, this incident took place during one of the great feasts of the Jews. They would celebrate them in the temple in Jerusalem every year. Jews would pour into Jerusalem from all over their world. Temple would just be an absolute madhouse. Well, the day before this incident, Jesus had been teaching in the temple, and some of the people were captivated, thinking maybe Jesus was the Messiah they'd been waiting for. Others were thinking, now this is a deceiver, a madman. He's dangerous. At the end of that day, Jesus went back to the Mount of Olives, which is right across the valley from the temple. And we're told on this day, the day of the incident, Jesus comes back into the temple. He's teaching the crowds. And the Jewish leaders who are watching are ticked. So, as Jesus is teaching, John says, and John was there, these Jewish leaders drag out this woman who had been caught in the act, in the very act of adultery. One of those things we'd rather keep a deep, dark secret, right? Now, she crossed the line. Either she's married or he is, not to each other. And to God, any sex outside the marriage bed is sin. 
She's guilty. And no one back then would have challenged that. A whole lot of people, in fact, maybe most people today might challenge that. We don't believe that sex has to be reserved for the marriage bed, right? Premarital sex, just testing the waters before taking the plunge, right? Cohabiting, testing the waters on steroids. A lot of people are going to argue it's smart when they've never examined the data. Having a fling, a mistress, an open marriage, there are those who would say it's all okay, except God, who tells us that any sex outside the marriage bed is a sin for some really, really, really solid reasons, which I can't go into this morning. But guys, listen, all the people in this story would buy that she's guilty, including the woman. Legit guilt, legit shame. But there's something else going on. She was guilty. And some of the shame that she was feeling was legitimate, appropriate, designed to lead her back to a God-honoring path. And so if those in the story had kept it in that bedroom, it might have accomplished what God meant it to do. But the guys who caught her were as mean as snakes. They wanted to humiliate her, and they wanted to trap Jesus if they could. So they dragged her through the streets, multiplying her shame. My guess is that she was still wearing whatever she was wearing or not when she was caught in the act. Probably not much. They drag her into the temple during one of the holy days when the place is absolutely crawling with people. All of these witnesses multiplying the shame exponentially. See, it's one thing to be naked with a lover. Another thing to be naked in a leering crowd, especially in a holy place. And because we religious people are often lousy at grace, people are going to be gawking, probably snickering, pulling out their iPhones for pics, posting them on social media, thinking up snippy aphorisms to put on top of those pictures. She's guilty. So's the dude, wherever he was. In their eyes, not as guilty as she was, a bunch of jerks. But she needs some grace. And although some of her shame is appropriate, a lot of the shame she was feeling was flat-out evil. Think about it. Some of the shame that you have felt is legit, and a whole lot of the shame that you have felt is not. How many of you guys have ever felt body-shamed? You don't have to raise your hand. Either because you think you're ugly or because someone else has mocked you. I worry that I body shame people all the time. I worry that whenever I get here, my ripped body is going to make you guys ashamed, right? That's why I don't wear muscle shirts when I preach. That's humor. Some of you guys feel shame because you keep failing to live up to someone else's expectations, or maybe your own. And you're kind of like telling yourself, I'm not the man I should be, the spouse, the parent I should be. I'm not as smart or as motivated or as gifted or as athletic as I wish I were, as my wife wishes I were, as my parents wish I were. Because people can be cruel. We are really good at shaming each other, at rubbing each other's faces and their failures and their sins, good at labeling people, shunning people, canceling people whenever they give us an opening. In fact, it's a cultural game, it seems. How cruel is that? So maybe you've never been caught in the act of adultery, but I suspect that you have felt a whole lot of what she felt. Not only legitimate shame, because she blew it. She sinned. She knew it. But then people try to shame you, humiliate you, label you, shun you, cancel you. We all have those dark secrets. In fact, some of you guys live in fear that somehow you're going to be discovered, you're going to be outed, you're going to be shamed, right? Some of you guys, you might admit that you've got some of those dark secrets to a few, but not to everyone because you're afraid a lot of people are just going to judge you or maybe reject you or cancel you. Some of you guys feel like you're a fraud. You try to look clean on the outside, but you know how dirty you are on the inside. Maybe it's not just a sin you committed. 
maybe you think that sin defines you now. It owns you. It's not just your past. It's who you are. You think when you refuse to trust God. So a lot of us kind of live in fear of both men and God. And guilt and shame can suck the joy right out of life. Or maybe yours is not a secret anymore. You've been caught, you've been outed, you've been humiliated, you've been shamed, and you desperately need some grace, some healing. Fortunately, God is really good at it. So these holy men, they're like, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Moses tells us to stone her. What do you say? Because if Jesus told them to let her go, then he's breaking the law. And if Jesus tells them to kill her, well, he's always about this grace stuff, right? They thought they had Jesus trapped. Well, John says that <laughs> Jesus kneels down and starts writing in the dust with his finger. I think that part's so cool. Had to tick him off, right? Some of the guys think maybe Jesus was just jotting down the Ten Commandments. Not just the do not commit adultery part, but all ten of them, because none of us score very good when we look at all ten. Others think it was just doodling, making them curious, making them sweat, maybe. One of my favorite conjectures is that maybe Jesus was writing down their sins as they watched him. They start squirming. Jesus was just letting them know, I, I, I know who you are. Right? I know what you're hiding. Or maybe Jesus is just kneeling down doodling because it's grace. Because as they're waiting for his answer, all of their eyes, their leering eyes, shift from her to him. Quit staring at her, you perverts. Look at me, Jesus says. Which is what he says to all of us. Don't look at that sin. Look at me. Well, John says that they kept demanding an answer, so Jesus stands up and he says, okay. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down and kept on writing. Let the one of you who has never sinned, let the one of you guys who is without sin, that's really what it says, whichever one of you is perfect, sinless, Take this rock and crush her with it, Jesus says. Can you throw the rock? Now, if you already know this story, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't throw a stone? He's the only one who could have. He's the only one who ever could have, but it, it would have been counterproductive, wouldn't it? Since in a few months, Jesus was there to take the stoning for her. That's what the cross is all about, isn't it? I mean, Jesus on that cross is telling this girl, I'm going to take this one for you. And I'm going to take any other of the sins that are separating you and God. Because God loves you this much. So why is it that even though the only one who had the right to stone her didn't? But so many of us Jesus followers still do. Well, after all these self-righteous accusers slink away, Jesus stands up and he looks at the woman and he says, where are they, your accusers? Didn't anyone condemn you? Ever wondered why he asked her that? I don't know. Maybe because after Jesus said, let the one who's without sin cast the first stone, maybe she bowed her head and covered her eyes and waited for the pain to begin. She didn't know. And when Jesus says, where are you accusers? She gets up and she looks around and sees no one. And a different set of tears start to flow. Where are they? Doesn't anyone condemn you? No, Lord. And then Jesus says this. He says, neither do I. Neither do I. How would you like to hear those words from Jesus? Now, Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you either, Jesus says. Now stop sinning. I'm not going to condemn you. That's grace. Now go stop sinning. That's truth. Truth and grace. Jesus never compromised on either. 
Adultery is a sin. It's a sin against your partner. It's a sin against your kids. It's a sin against another family. And it's a sin against God. It drives a wedge between a man or a woman and God. But Jesus doesn't call her sin, sin, to condemn her. He does it to liberate her, to set her free, to restore her to her family and to her God. But those words, neither do I, are haunting. You know why? I think he said them because Jesus wasn't there to condemn her. Jesus came here to take our place. He didn't come here to condemn us. He came here to take our place. He looks her in the eyes, maybe even wiped away her tears, and he says, I've got this one for you. I'll take it for you. Now go and sin no more. Truth and grace, truth and grace. And guys, we need them both. See, we call Jesus the great physician. He's the perfect doctor for the soul. And if you are battling guilt, whether it's the appropriate kind or the inappropriate, you need some Jesus. If you're battling shame, whether it's the legit kind or the illegitimate kind, you need some Jesus. You need real truth and real grace. You need healing. And it starts with ruthless honesty. I confess my sins to God. I own it. No excuses, no rationalizing, no blaming someone else. I confess my sin to God. And I'm not just confessing my sin to God. I'm acknowledging that I am not strong enough or smart enough or good enough to fix myself. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need your grace. And then there's repentance, a change of mind, a change of direction. I'm not just asking God to forgive me. I'm asking him to help me see my sin the way he sees it. I don't like it there. I don't like what it's doing to me. I don't like what it's doing to you. God, I want you to help me change. Not just words. I want you to help me change. That's repentance. And then maybe the hardest one of all, you accept his forgiveness. You trust his grace. You trust the awesomeness of our God. Listen, guys, if God forgives you, you've got to let it go. God sent his son to die on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin. He paid an extreme price for your forgiveness. The pinnacle of pride is to refuse to accept what God offers you, his grace. And then how about some gratitude? Give thanks. Thank God. Praise God. Because grace is worth some gratitude, isn't it? Now, don't you wish that John had told us the rest of the story, what happens next. Wonder whether this woman went through life tormented by the memories of her sin, her guilt, and her shame, or whether she allowed the grace of God to redefine her. She wish she knew. Maybe John didn't tell us because <laughs> it's your story. It's your story. It's up to you. It's up to me to write the ending. How are you going to write the ending for you? Guys, we want Capital City Christian to be a hospital for the wounded where they come to, to bleed, to find healing. So it had better be a place where we find healing. So remember those nine big ideas that I started with? I'm going to give them to you one more time. Feel them. Number one, the only self that you need to measure up to you is the self that God means you to be. You don't need to measure up to what any of us think you should be. You don't even need to measure up to what you think you should be. The only self you need to measure up to is what God means you to be. Number two, you are accepted by the grace of God without regard to your deserving. Because guys, none of us deserve grace. That's why it's called grace. We never deserve grace, which is okay. Because we have a gracious God. Number three, you are accepted by God along with your shadows and the mix of good and bad that you breed in them. Listen, guys. I love and accept my wife and my kids. I love and accept my grandkids, even when they're complete twits. Fortunately, they love and accept me even when I'm a complete twit. And if we can love and accept each other as flawed as we are, do any of you think you can outlove God? Number four. This is huge, guys. This is huge. Grace has set you free to accept yourself totally 
without conditions, even though you don't approve of everything you accept. It's hard for us. A lot of us refuse to forgive what God forgives, including ourselves. But once we are accepted by God as flawed as we are, we can begin to accept ourselves as flawed as we are. Number five, nothing that you deserve to be ashamed of will ever make you unacceptable to God. God loves us even when we mess up. When we mess up, we ought to feel some guilt. We ought to feel some shame. But there's nothing you've ever done that will make God love you less. It's hard to believe, but that is God's truth. Six, you can forgive anybody who has ever infected you with shame that you don't deserve. Parent, friend, enemy. It's going to be hard. There are people in your life who've tied some pretty heavy weights around your neck. But if they ruin your life, it will be your fault. If there's nothing in you that God can't forgive, then there's nothing they've done to you that you can't forgive with His help. And once you begin to forgive, you will be set free. You can also forgive yourself for anything that you've ever done to shame yourself or another person. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do of all, forgiving yourself. But if you refuse to forgive yourself, guys, you're working against God because He has forgiven you. You're setting yourself up as a higher tribunal than God. Number eight, the grace of God heals the shame that you don't deserve and it heals the shame that you do deserve. And you've got both. And God's grace will heal both kinds if you let Him. And number nine, grace is the best thing in the world, the very best. Do you believe that? Some of you guys need some healing. You need Jesus. You need to trust Him. The next little bit here, if you want to talk, if you need some healing, we've got an elder praying for you in the prayer room in the back. I'm going to hang on down here. After the service, come up and let's talk. Or during this next song, come on up and let's talk. Guys, He's wanting to heal you. And if we're going to be used by Him to heal others, you've got to let Him start working on you, right? Let's stand and let's sing this song.